Okay, so this is a presentation that uh, Bevan's going to give based on a conversation he and I had last week, and he's done some tweaks to the model. But I think the model's really interesting, uh, not only for um, hubs to offer local funding to producers, but also for OFN to, to make an income, uh, particularly in the light of our conversations with the Swiss funders, um, who I think might be interested in this as a, another layer of OFN. So I'm going to hand over to, to Bevan to talk through the model and show us a bit of detail. Yeah, great, Nick. Thanks. So, essentially, we know what all the benefits of the OFN already are in the fact of, you know, creating local food networks, um, fairer, healthier food system, etc. One of the key things I think that, that has been missing is what a lot of producers, especially in Africa, for instance, uh, are, are missing access to fund funding and finance. So, whilst the Open Food Network gives them a market, they don't necessarily get funding. Um, the other thing is that a lot of people are interested in investing, um, but obviously they're also looking for returns. So what we do here is we're able to offer them even better returns. Then for the entire network, we can also help reduce transaction costs um, through, the, through the credit model that we, we're looking at using. And then we can also, through all of that, increase um, Open Food Network's own financial sustainability in terms of commissions that it, it receives. So all those things sound a bit too good to be true, so we need to walk through them. Um, so if we look at the pre-funding of the producers, essentially producers are gonna be getting interest-free upfront funding. And the idea is to cover their cost of production. But clearly the issue here is that we need to understand our producers and we've got to have a careful risk management policy in place. What happens is the funding that they receive in cash is then reflected as negative credits in their account on the open food network. So that's a debt that they owe. Producers are the only ones that are allowed to have negative credits. Um, they must pay back these negative credits either through food that they are that they sell on the open food network or they must pay the cash back ultimately now typically across the pool of producers we would expect that they would make some sort of a profit okay and most of the producers will ultimately end up with a positive credit balance and they can then withdraw that positive credit balance um, for cash on the system um, Clearly, I've made the point that OFN assessors, which is a new role here, would have to play a crucial risk management role. And just, now, to, just to chip in there, Bowen, one of the things I've been thinking about over the weekend is that there are organisations in the UK that are screening applications from, from small-scale farmers who want land, and then they are selecting people to offer them mm. this land. And, and so there are other organisations. We wouldn't necessarily have to recruit our own assessors. We could link up with other people who are... That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and someone like Paula here in South Africa also does that, that sort of role. And yeah. And, and yeah, typically those tend to be NGOs. And, and this is the point, is you're now offering a tool which people can come to for funding. They don't have to go to the banks. Effectively, we're becoming a, a, a food bank, um, an agricultural yeah. bank in a sense. But what we're doing, the, these are the sustainable development goals that this addresses, really. So all of a sudden, you're now becoming exceedingly attractive to um, ESG investors, impact investors, food security, you know, all of that becomes a major issue that we can help solve. So how does that work? So, so essentially, what we're asking our shoppers to do all, and and investors who who want to come into this is they would they would pay a certain amount into a producer reserve account, okay? Um, that reserve account is backed by credits, which are then issued to the buyer or the investor, and those credits are are obviously known as reserve credits, right? They can't necessarily be spent by the shopper. He the shopper would spend his other credits in his shopping account. Yeah. This is his reserve account. And it only needs to be a once of payment. A shopper would pay, say, $50 into a reserve account and it would just sit there. The, so that's the, the equivalent is like a saver at a bank where the bank takes the saver's money and they use that money to go and invest elsewhere. Yep. So the percentage of the reserve account, we would now distribute in cash to the producers. And obviously we need to understand what that percentage needs to be and make sure we get the repayments, etc. Um, and as I said, the producers must always clear their negative balance if they want to remain in good standing. So we could have, for instance, like uh, an Uber credit rating. Each producer can now have some sort of a rating which they would they would get, you know, after a while, and they, they perform well by paying back. So we really incentivize them to pay back um, their their funding. 
Um, and obviously now this, prof this, this production and this profit is now bought by shoppers on the OFN through hubs. And those shoppers and those hubs must now fund their shopping accounts in order to buy this. So what we're doing is we're taking money. We are letting nature grow that money. Um, and it's creating food and more food. And that's sucking in new money into the open food network. Um, and, and that's, you know, doesn't that make a lot more sense to grow money rather than just to issue money arbitrarily or like a cryptocurrency mines currency according to some digital formula, whatever, you know, I think this is a lot, a lot more natural, a lot fairer. Yeah. So just very briefly to show you how that then um, looks in the, in the model, um, we could, for instance, have 30 investors um, and let's say each wants to invest $5,000. Um, we could have, let's say across the whole open food network as a system, we could have 9,000 buyers or it can work for an individual instance as well. As I said, each buyer can place just $50, etc. That sum would give us $600,000. That's this blue line that you see here, the $600,000 line. That's our funding reserve account. Okay, um, now if all of that got funded and spent and came back into the open food network, it would basically mean those 9,000 buyers would then spend an extra $86 a month on buying all that food back. That's how I sort of worked that out. That $600,000 can go into, let's say, a pool of 60 producers. Let's say we, we fund 60% of those producers, okay? Um, which is $360,000 that gets funded. So this is what's happening here in the first phase here. And this, this cycle really represents like, let's say a complete cycle, which would be a monthly cycle for instance, but I've just done it to see how everything balances out to make sure the model you know, works. So here we start at $600,000. We fund 60% of the reserve account. This money is drawn down, this green line here. And it leaves us with what, $240,000 of the $600,000. Those producers then go and they produce their food and their products, etc. They then go and they sell the products back on the open food network. And this going, going above the, the blue line here represents the producer making a profit. This is a factor here that we can play with. So for instance, people might say, well, what if the entire pool, what if every single one of those 60 producers defaults? What if they take the money and run? So that's what, that's what would happen. You, you fund your money and you've, you've effectively lost it. Um, but the buyers have effectively lost it because the buyers and the investors are the ones that are taking the risk here. Okay. But that's a very unlikely situation. If the producers just manage to repay, they don't make any profit. Um, then they produce and they go back up to the 600,000 line and they, they don't pay us any commission when they withdraw money out of the system. Now you'll see that in, in the, in the, if you look down here, you see our proposed, OFN commission versus the current OFN commission. So if, for instance, if we were charging 5% to hubs for all money that went through the hub, this is what we would get $32,400 out of that amount of spend per buyer per month. That's if every producer just pays back. As soon as producers start making a profit, so let's say they make a 10% profit, we start to see that our commission now starts to become higher than a normal standard flat rate 5% commission. The reason for this is obviously producers are now creating more. They're creating an abundance. They're creating a profit from, from the funding that we gave them. This profit is ultimately being spent on the open food network. So it means that there's more money coming in. And what we're doing, when those producers withdraw their profit out of the system, so let's make it a 50, well, let's make it a 30% a profit for the producer. So you see it's a little bit more of a profit that they withdraw out of the system now. We now charge them a commission, 5% commission. Whenever anyone withdraws money out of their account, we charge a 5% commission for that. So there's the producers getting charged a commission. So that's why our open food network commission is going up um, versus a normal commission where we only charge hubs, for instance. Now, I think that's fair. I think, I think charging a producer 5% on the profit that he makes out of the funding we give him for free is a really fair model, I would think. 
anyway, that's the producer element of it. The money coming in, the funding, how the producer producing, selling it back for a profit, and then taking his profit, withdrawing his profit out of the system for which we receive some commission. And we go back to effectively that $600,000 reserve account level. All right, so if we go back to the, um, the system, that's how we did it on the producer side. Now we look at the buyers and the investors. And I'm saying that shoppers and investors who are not necessarily interested in shopping per se, they can actually be rewarded with higher returns than they would achieve elsewhere. And the only thing they need to do is just retain their cash in the OFN exchange um, as part of this producer reserve account. So for instance, $50 invested by a shopper in, in, in a normal bank savings account, let's say they got 6%. Okay, I know that's a nice return for Europe, etc. Um, let's say they got 6%, they would effectively get 6%. But because we are effectively magnifying those funds, we're, we're pooling those funds from other investors, and we're also increasing the, um, the, the, the money sitting in the account, um, th that's working for us as the producer makes a profit and the hub makes a profit, then that reserve account grows and it can affect, it, it achieve a higher effective return, 8%. So going back again to the model, we would see in this case, if, if, the, um, if the OFN is able to receive, let's make it, let's make it a more realistic percentage, 3%. Uh, that the OFN is able to receive. And let's say that's what a buyer or investor was able to receive. We're actually giving them 0.67% higher um, than what they would get in a bank. And this is due to the, the pooling effect and the, you, you know, the, the abundance that's coming into the system through the producers and the hubs repaying uh, extra higher margins. And you know, we're not, no, nobody's, nobody's taking out any, any extra money here. It's just, it's just the fact that what happens with interest, and obviously compound interest would grow this month by month and, and year by year. So what's happening, um, that little jump up here at the end of the year, let's make it a slightly higher amount so you can see it's a, it's a slightly higher jump up there. Every month or every year, that interest gets added back as a reward to the investors or to the shoppers who've held money in the account. And clearly, you would you would be rewarded with a certain percentage of credit so on a pro rata basis a very simple computer calculation just to reward people on that so i don't know if that's if that's clear nick i mean that's yeah. i think that is a you know it's first of all it's attractive to investors because of the food security element but you're now able to also offer them a higher interest rate yeah yeah no that's all good, that's all good. okay so that's on the investors and the shoppers getting a, a better rate. Um, and whoops, I have to go back there. Sorry. Um, the reason we do that is because we we pass all of our interest received to our shoppers, investors. We're a nonprofit, so we don't necessarily need to hang on to the interest that sits in these accounts. Okay. And as I say, interest is received on any uninvested cash that sits in the reserve account, and obviously all cash that comes from the operating account. So this is when hubs and shoppers fund their shopping accounts, which is going to be significant in, over time as, as the number of um, shoppers grows, that operating account will become significant cash that we're sitting on. And this is ultimately the model that Facebook's Libra uses. They want people to fund uh, a, an account with Libra and you get Libra credits. And then Facebook and all these people will literally sit on the interest that sits in a Swiss account. So we're doing exactly the same thing, but we've got all these other benefits as well. So obviously the better the performance in terms of production and in terms of profit margins that the producers and the hubs enjoy, the more cash will be sucked into the OFN, the more cash will be spent on the network, assuming that the buyers are obviously wanting to buy all of this stuff that gets produced, and the greater the effective outperformance of the interest becomes, right? Yeah. Um, and then, as I said, it's obviously it's compounded and added every time and investors can withdraw their funds at any time, um, as can shoppers. But obviously shoppers, you know, that we would want them to stay in because they're part of the open food network. Yeah. So now we also talk about being able to reduce transaction costs. So, so what we're saying is that we're moving to a model now, which is kind of, which is effectively cashless. So buyers and shops and hubs would, would pre fund their accounts with cash into Let's assume this was a global instance. Um, it could work obviously for each instance just as easily. But if it was a global instance, we have a global account sitting in a Swiss bank account with a Swiss foundation somewhere. 
Um, and basically, um, sorry, dogs barking. Yeah. <laughs> Once the money is in the system, then it simply becomes a credit-based system. And transferring of credits within the system doesn't incur bank fees or, or, or transaction fees or anything like that. So um, that's why I'm saying that transaction costs are, are reduced in terms of making payments. Now, the other interesting thing is we'll get to is the um, down below in the, in the green here. Um, we said that producers are only going to pay commission when withdrawing their profits. So that's really the only charge to producers. The hubs are going to pay commission on the gross sales because they've obviously had to pre-fund their accounts. But they only pay also when they withdraw credits, when they withdraw their credits into cash. If hubs or shoppers, well, hubs especially, if they leave credits in the system, we're effectively giving them free cash flow funding which is a huge, another huge thing for shops because now they don't, you know, they don't have to worry about their cash flow cycle. Um, yeah. We obviously want them to withdraw their cash, which they will do because that's when we make a commission when people withdraw cash. Um, and I'm, I would suggest 5%, which I think is, is very fair. Now, there's no other costs to using the open food network in terms of that. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of the financial sustainability for open food network itself, We've said that this is probably increases the attractiveness of the entire network to the extent that we can draw in more enterprise, sorry, environmental social governance investors, impact funding investors, et cetera, because of obviously it's, it's, it provides sustainable returns, but it also is enhancing job creation, food security, et cetera. The other, the other new interest stream now is the fact that we get all of this pooled interest on all the cash. But as I say, we pay that to shoppers and investors effectively as their reward. We, perhaps the open food network can take some of that interest as well because that will become significant in, over time. Obviously, the open food can, network now makes a commission on, on all cash withdrawals in the system. The reason our commission is now higher than a previous model, which just charges a hub, say a flat rate of 2% or 5%, whatever it is, is we assume under the, under, under the existing model that the hub would pay commission on their gross sales, okay, for using the software, but we're also now including the commission from the producers who are withdrawing cash, but only on their profits. So effectively what we're doing is we're charging commission twice. We're charging commission once to the producer and once to the hub. But actually, it's very fair if you think about it. No one's going to mind that. Um, so, and I think we can be quite transparent about it. I don't think it's a problem. Yep. Now, obviously, there's a cost to running this exchange and running this model. So, what I'm imagining is that the higher OFN commission that we make, um, which can be quite significant, I mean, it, it can range um, in, to thousands of dollars a month. Um, now that can go towards paying the costs for someone to maintain a reserve account, as well as for assessors who work with the producers on deciding who's best to fund. I've got a little bit more I'll say about that now, but this is an example of how the commission increases. So when the producer starts making a profit, remember we only charge the producer commission when he starts making a profit. So when he goes past one, which is effectively a hundred percent repayment, to a 20% profit, to a 40% profit for, for the entire pool, then our commission starts to go up. So it's quite a nice model because as the producer does better, we do better in terms of commission. Yeah. Um, I've talked about how, giving free working capital for the hubs. Um, and yeah, I think the, uh, the other thing that obviously goes toward in, in improving our commission is obviously if the hub makes a higher margin, we also get a higher commission, but we would have got a higher commission in the current model anyway. Um, so that's fine. And, and obviously the, the greater the percentage of the reserve account that we fund, if we fund 80% of the reserve account, that's far more money that's going into producers' hands, which is then coming back as potential profit, which means we can make more money potentially. Remember that banks under the current fractional model of lending, they lend out probably over 90% of the cash that they're sitting on. I don't think we should do anything like that. We need to be, we need to be risk averse. And I would, I would think something like two thirds or 60, 66% of lending out of that cash is probably prudent. Yep. Um, in the system, it's fairly simple. All we would need to do is we would need to create two credit accounts. I think there's a credit account already in the system for people to have 
small credits lying around. Yeah, that's and that right. would be, okay, so, so that would effectively be like your shopping credit account where buyers would just fund that account and they would use it to pay hubs and hubs would pay producers, et cetera. Then there's this other, there's this other account, the reserve account, which, which you don't want to touch, but it's, it's literally just $50 per, per shopper once off. It doesn't, you know, then they don't have to pay that again and again and again. And investors might want to throw in, you know, a hundred thousand and an investor might want to come in with a million dollars. The problem is the more money that goes into that reserve account, the more, the more food you're producing, the more, the more funding you're giving to producers, which means the more food is going to come back. So are we going to have enough buyers to soak up all of that food that gets produced, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a balancing act where we need to, we need to grow that reserve account organically um, and then obviously bring in the buyers to, to, to purchase all of that excess production. Okay, that's on the credit accounts in the system. In terms of operational itself, we would need to maintain a bank reserve account. Um, and that bank reserve account will always balance with the reserve credits. We need to obviously maintain an OFN operating account because this is money going in and out of the system as people fund their accounts and withdraw their cash as, as required. And that operating account is obviously where we would earn the OFN commission as well. Obviously, any interest earned in that operating account can then be swept to the reserve account to, to um, reward the buyer. But perhaps that interest from the operating account should be OFN's interest. I don't know, to go, to go towards paying you know, the assessors and the people who are operating this account. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, the only required means of payment now in the system is creating shopping account credits. Okay, so um, obviously you, you don't use your reserve credits. As I say, it would suit a global instance, but you can you can certainly run this for e for each local instance. It's just that when you're doing it for a global instance, you only need you know one person managing the the, the main account, whereas each instance otherwise would have to have someone managing it. Uh, there's a little bit about here how you know on a global instance you're almost creating like a global currency, and that can have really interesting connotations for people who want to come in and trade currencies through this. For instance, we could we could attract huge amounts of money into this but the point is that money would then have to be used to make food <laughs> yeah. and not just to speculate on on currencies right mm -hmm. yeah okay so so how do we pay for this i say keep it simple as i said the billing is now incredibly simplified we don't the ofn each instance now doesn't have to go to each hub and, and send them a monthly account and say please can you play us two percent or five percent or whatever it is you know um effectively they get billed when they when they when they want money. When they take money out of the system, they get billed automatically, and no questions asked. Um, it's much simpler um, to run. Um, as I said, obviously transferring credits through the system is seamless. There's no commissions paid on transferring credits. There's no bank costs or anything like that. You don't have to have cards, although you obviously can have other payment mechanisms. Um, so as I said, the buyers typically aren't going to get hit with a 5% withdrawal because buyers typically fund their accounts and they buy food with it. They might want to take money out and investors should also not get hit with a 5% because, you know, investors are investing to make that return. They don't necessarily want to get hit with 5%. But of course, we can charge buyers and look at charging investors. We'll, we'll see. Um, as I said, the increased commission can go towards paying these assessors and the people who will have to work with the producers like a loan officer. If it, you'd probably have to have one or two people per instance because you, you're working on the ground, you're working locally with people. Um, but of course, you know, this can lead into consulting and, you know, obviously there's a lot of other revenues that can come from consulting work, etc. So this just enhances the whole package that we're able to offer people. Um, but the, 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 the point is that we are also, um, we are also basically simplifying the entire structure. So people who are already dealing with billing and stuff now, you know, a lot of their hours can be freed up to, to manage a reserve account, etc. Um, this is not, a lot of this is, is managed within the system. It, it's not something that has to be, um, require a lot of people, but it does require people with a, a clear head who who are going to manage it at a central level um, and as I say I think it would work best under a, under a global instance so that's it I've just thrown in the values there because I've tried to align this with as much of the OFN values as possible um, just very quickly 
completing the cycle here. We, we saw the producer bit, what happens. Obviously, hubs now, um, once the producers have produced food and it's coming to the system, hubs make a profit. So, you know, again, if, if a hub makes 100% profit, um, this is this is the the buyer funding their account to to cover that hundred percent profit, and this is the hubs then withdrawing their um, their money from the system. The dark green line is our commission going up as the hubs withdraw money. Obviously, we charge them commission, and and that gets paid instantly. Um, you'll see that the obviously the, um, the both the interest rate and the the higher commission goes up as the hubs make more money as well. So if they make 150 percent, which is unlikely, but I mean, it is retail. So you know retailers tend to go for those 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 larger margins. But this just completes the cycle. And what it shows you is that obviously the operational money is flowing in and out and in and out. But ultimately, it's always balancing at the end of every cycle. And of course, this is going to be an ongoing thing, and there's going to be pools of producers and pools of buyers. But but basically, the the logic is sound in that um, at the end of the day, we never dip below our our buyer reserve unless we start getting defaults. You know, all all of the time, producers start defaulting. But if we did that, if we see that people are defaulting, we just we we just you know call a halt to it, and and that's is why you know banks make a hell of a lot of money but they have strong risk management processes in place so i think you know having said all that um i think we should see producers making money out of this and um hubs making money and the ofn making money okay. so what i'll do is i'll share the spreadsheet nick i've worked through the steps in the cycle so that people can see how credits are transferred from negative credits from the producers the hub is negative but he has to fund that account um, the buyers, obviously, they fund their account. And then the reserve account, you see on in terms of the credits and in terms of the cash, it, 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 it'll it dip as we fund the producers. But as that money comes back in, um, it, it all comes back into the account. And then at the final point, we add the interest. So the interest steps up and then we've got more money the next month to um, to. So it just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. So yeah, Nick, that's kind of the long and the short of it. Um, there, there must be. There is a third tab on there, Ben. Do we, do we need to look at the cash flow tab on that? Uh, so that was just I was just looking from year to year okay. as to how interest grows, obviously compounded, and and this is just you know the if we if we start off with those numbers, then this is the cash that we would make as a, this is a single instance, assuming. 9,000 buyers, if I double it, we'll start to see some serious numbers. You'll see all these things go off the charts here. Yeah. The cash flow jumps up to 1.4 million. So earning you know $90,000 of, of interest a year. Um, and then just adding up and it, it becomes obviously compound interest, eighth wonder of the world, etc. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, great. Good, thank you, Bevan, that's fantastic. Um, I think we can probably end the recording now and we'll just have a conversation then about how we're going to pass this on to the OFN team. Is that okay if we okay. Stop, stop at this point? Yeah, great. No, no other questions really, hey? Or... No, no, that's all clear for me. I'm sure this is going to provoke questions from other people, but uh, sure. we'll leave the recording now and then people can come back to you. Um, Thanks, Nick. Probably on Slack. Is that the best way to communicate with you? I guess. Or you, you, you should. You're going to probably open something, are you? Or yeah, we'll, we'll yes, we'll 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 kick it off in Slack. And, yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm all, I'm still all new to this, so I'm happy for you to take the lead. <laughs> good. Good. All right. And